Welcome to part four of lecture five of aerospace propulsion. So the answer is that turbulent eddies essentially enhance the flame propagation speed or the effective flame propagation speed. So in this figure, I've tried to illustrate that. Um, so you can think of each of these circles as a turbulent eddy uh, that exists within the combustion chamber. And let's just say that this is where ignition happens and this eddy is sort of rotating clockwise. The red uh, sort of radiating curves represent the laminar flame propagation and the uh, red and orange uh, curves on the surfaces of the eddies represent uh, convection of the flame front around by turbulent spread. So basically the fact that the eddy is moving around is sort of moving the flame around more quickly. So um, in the figure on the left here, this is at the point of ignition. So there's just one tiny point where there's a flame. Um, then we have a half of an eddy revolution later, so that flame front has moved halfway around this original uh, eddy, on, or these two original eddies that it was in contact with, um, and there's also been some laminar spread. Um, this one's had a chance to get a quarter of the way around, because essentially uh, once this eddy hits this point, then it splits, uh, the flame splits off. And at a full uh, eddy revolution, we can see that the uh, laminar propagation in itself would, is not even enough to have completely covered uh, most of the uh, eddies um, right at the site of combustion, and yet we have flame fronts that have propagated very far away, you know, several eddies away. Um, so we can sort of visually see that that turbulent stru those pre turbulent structures being present will significantly enhance the rate at which the flame is able to spread around. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about the flow in valves. So the flow in these valves is highly compressible, it's very unsteady, and it's periodic in nature. Um, so there, there's sort of a port diameter and a head diameter, and of course this moves up and down, and so there's a perpendicular uh, length here which is revolved all the way around to create kind of an annular area uh, at which the flow uh, can exit uh, an intake valve into the cylinder. So initially, um, PC over PI, so PI is the uh, sort of, let's say, the stagnation pressure um, out in the intake port, and the, this is the static pressure in the combustion chamber. Um, Initially, this is less than one, and it's going to drop quite low as the um, piston moves down, um, creating suction. And eventually, it's going to drop below the value. This is 1 over 1.89. This is 0.528. Um, th this is basically the value at which the flow chokes. So we would actually expect to get choked flow with sort of Mach number of 1 um, during some parts of the cycle. Um, and, and then sort of later as, as the sort of eventually went, as the cylinder fills, it just could sort of increase above one, in which case you would get sort of flow going back the other way. Um, and then in the exhaust valve, it's a similar idea. Initially, the stagnation uh, pressure in the combustion chamber um, is, is high and the static pressure in the exhaust port is low. Um, and again, that flow can choke as it comes out. Um, and then that, that ratio gets closer to 1, so the Mach number decreases as um, more and more of the, the air leaves the cylinder. Uh, eventually, again, would increase above 1 and potentially get back flow. So basically, how much flow we can get through the valve is restricted by the geometry since we're getting to the point that the flow is choking. Typically, um, on a, especially on an intake valve, uh, we have to think about the discharge coefficient of the valve, which is just a, a, a constant factor that's less than one that essentially accounts for the effective area reduction due to the fact that the flow is going to have some local separation. So we can see this here that um, in, in during some parts of uh, the cycle, especially when the valve is wide open, there's unlikely to be sort of clean flow all the way through and there's probably a local separation so that the effective minimum area here is actually smaller than the geometric minimum area. Right, so that's why we get a discharge coefficient less than one.
interestingly, it's common in valve timing to actually have an overlap period between the intake and exhaust valves being open. So here we would see sort of the exhaust valve opens, um, and then here's the intake valve opening, and we see is there's a small region where both valves are open, right around top dead center. Um, it's not really obvious at first why you would want that to be the case. It seems like it might um, give some undesirable effects. And the reality is that it depends on what engine operating condition you're at. That overlap does reduce the volumetric efficiency if you're at low engine speeds or sort of a low load on the engine. And basically why that's happening is here's the intake uh, port and here's the exhaust. Um, what will happen it, when these are both open is that you're basically going to get uh, exhaust gas it will get pulled out of the exhaust port directly into the intake port. And since then that uh, will be mixed with the fresh air, uh, fresh fuel air mixture that's drawn into the next cycle. Um, we actually have less uh, air fuel mixture uh, to, to do the combustion with and the volumetric efficiency goes down. But if we're at operating at high speed in a or a wide open throttle position, um, this overlap has a, can have a net beneficial effect by enhancing the amount of uh, fresh air fuel mixture that we can pull into the cylinder during the intake cycle. Um, so the opening in the exhaust port essentially creates a, a, a path for a low static pressure back pressure um, and this will help to draw more air fuel mixture in increasing uh, the amount of power produced uh, by the ignition and uh, combustion events. Finally, let's talk a little bit about intake and exhaust ducting. Um, so again, we saw that in some designs like the radial valve engines uh, or the radial engines, there were sleeve valves that didn't require intake and exhaust ducting. But most modern internal combustion engines used on aerospace applications do have sort of traditional intake and exhaust manifolds. Um, so the valves in the engine don't all open at the same time, right? Each cylinder is sort of part, uh, is offset in timing from the others. Um, so when you've got cylinders that are attached to the valves that are open, they back to the act as a volume. And then the intake and exhaust ducts behave like Helmholtz resonators. So a Helmholtz resonator is basically a spring mass system that has a characteristic resonant frequency, right? So here's a sketch of sort of the spring mass system. Um, and if any of you are taking or have taken mechanical vibrations, this will look very familiar. But basically there's a certain frequency at which this sort of system wants to vibrate. And um, fluid mechanically, you actually get the same thing when you have essentially a pipe um, that is sitting on top of a volume. The volume acts like the spring. Um, and the um, sort of slug of fluid in the pipe act, acts as the mass that it sort of can bounce up and down on this compressible gas spring. So we actually take advantage of this in the design of uh, spark ignition engines. We tune the length of the intakes to achieve resonance. And basically, we want um, the natural frequency of that intake and cylinder system and the frequency at which we are trying to draw air into the cylinders to be equal. Um, because this will enhance the motion of that uh, mass of fluid in the exhaust pipes and therefore pull more air into the cylinders. So the natural frequency is a function of the cross-sectional area of the pipes, the volume of the cylinder, and the length of the, the, the runners. Uh, C is the speed of sound. Um, and then this is the in induction frequency, which is just related to the angular velocity. Um, and so you can see that the, you can sort of just use the parameter L here to make sure that these two things are equal. And then as a final thing, we should think a little bit about how pressure waves are going to move around in these intake and exhaust piping systems. Specifically, let's look at the intake system. So when we open the intake valve, right, at, at first we're generating uh, an expansion wave that's emitted upstream into the intake manifold. So this starts moving upstream. There's going to be a branch point somewhere in the manifold, right? Because there's sort of separate uh, little tubes that run to each cylinder. Those eventually come together. Um, when you sort of hit that change in area, you end up getting a reflection of a wave coming back. Um, 
as a compression wave back towards the cylinders. And the way that this resonance effect works is if this length is just right, that that compression wave arrives at the moment um, the valve is starting to close, um, it, it'll basically reflect as a compression wave again, and the compression wave will result in a pressure increase um, in the cylinders and better filling of the cylinder just before the valve closes. So essentially, it's a way to temporarily um, bump up the supply pressure just before the valve closes when there would tend to be very little flow in order to um, get a little bit of extra air into those cylinders. So this is in practice how we take advantage um, of those resonance effects. So that's all for today. Um, we'll move on and talk about propellers um, that are typically connected to these spark ignition engines in the next lecture.